and welcome to today's session all about Bing, great PPC tips for Microsoft advertising. Are you curious about expanding your pay-per-click advertising beyond Google Ads? Well, today we're taking a fresh and detailed look at Microsoft Advertising, formerly known as Bing Ads. Now, whether you're new to this platform or you want to learn what's new about its unique capabilities, such as the integration of targeting data from LinkedIn, well, you're going to be glad to be part of this conversation. Now, in addition to Simply Learn's resident pay-per-click expert, Brad Geddes, we're joined by a special guest, John Lee, Microsoft Advertising Learning Strategist. Brad and John will discuss the growing and evolving ecosystem of Microsoft Advertising, formerly known as Bing Ads, and we're going to learn how to easily import your campaigns, ads and targeting, and even your shopping product feeds. To get this conversation started, I just want to introduce us to Brad Geddes. He's the author of Advanced Google AdWords and the co-founder of the award-winning company Adalysis. Brad frequently writes columns for Search Engine Land, co-moderates the AdWords Forum on Webmaster World, and he's keynoted and spoken at more than 125 conferences and has led more than 100 seminars. Brad, it's really good to have you here with us again and talking about something other than Google. I know. Thanks, Dan. We speak a lot about Google or PPC strategy in, in general, but there's this other platform out there with a pretty solid reach. We probably don't talk about it enough. So, it, so to go through this today, we have someone I've known for, I don't know, 10 years, 12 years, and is often on panels that I'm either speaking on or I'm moderating and, and I need a good speaker. Turn to John. So I want everyone to really you know, pay attention to John today as Microsoft has some really cool import from Google, fast starts with, but you got to know some, some details, some fun details behind that, and some features Google just doesn't have. Um, John's a learning strategist at Microsoft. He's previously been in agencies and, and written a lot. Um, so this should be a, a great time with John. So John, welcome, and, and thanks for being here today. Brad, thank you for having me, Dan. Likewise, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So, um, yeah, happy to happy to talk search, happy to talk digital advertising, and specifically uh, because they pay my paycheck, happy to talk Microsoft advertising as well. So, uh, and everyone, I do want to make a note real quick, John. A lot of times you have the the speakers from the companies who only tow the corporate line, right? Who are like, nope, Google gave me this deck or Microsoft gave me this deck. I got to do it. And I can only say things this way. John used to run an agency. John has a lot of experience running accounts. So he's going to tell you what you actually need to know because Bing is very open with people of this is what we're good at, this is what we're bad at, and they'll tell you both, um, which is a really refreshing viewpoint. So. Don't take this at, from someone who works for Microsoft, although that's a you know good star on the resume. Um, take it from someone who actually knows what they're doing and spends all day in this platform. Thank you, Brad. Um, and and it's it's true though, right? Context means everything, and, and Microsoft advertising, formerly known as Bing Ads, without the context of what's happening on Google, you know, direct competition, but even what's happening within the industry at large, we think about retail and native advertising, all these different things, um, context is king. Um, and so to that end, I will, I will tow the company line ever so briefly here to get things kicked off. And only because as you've heard Dan mentioned, I think Brad, you mentioned it, and now I mentioned it, is that as a, as a business, um, we just went through a rebranding exercise. And so many of you likely know us as Bing Ads, um, we are now Microsoft Advertising. And so, you know, a lot of you, I'm sure, are like, well, duh, it should have been called that all along. I'm, I'm in that camp as well. Um, you know, but it does, it helps us align with, uh, with, the, with the, the big business um, all above Microsoft. But, you know, thinking through transformation, right, that's what this is all about. You know, uh, we've had a, a culture internally of really being about people uh, and that shows in the way that we build relationships it, it shows in the way that we even develop the product with a lot of user feedback um, it's all there uh, and so when we we know that brands as a whole are built by people and that instills trust uh, and so from there then what does that mean well we're going to be doing our part to protect your data uh, again not doing stupid stuff with it exporting in places it shouldn't go aggregating things and in, in what you see with data and targeting and restricting bias and targeting groups. I mean, we've all, we've all been hearing about tech lash, right? Over the last year, two years or so, um, we are very cognizant of that as well. And so we want to make sure that we're doing right by you, uh, the customer, uh, focused on people. Um, 
you're going to hear me talk a lot about audience today at, at various times. And so whether it's your data, our data, somewhere in the middle, uh, all of that means amazing targeting uh, for you, uh, the advertiser. And of course, being that we are Microsoft, there's this massive ecosystem that we get to tap into. We call it the Microsoft Graph. Uh, that does now include LinkedIn, but if you think about you know, Office and, and all the different uh, devices, whether it's just PCs with running Windows, but even now, uh, you know, mobile, both phones as well as tablets running, running Office and all the different um, Microsoft apps that are out there. I've actually just discovered that today that Whiteboard, which is one of my personal favorite uh, Microsoft apps, even that one's on, on Macs now. So um, we're everywhere. <laughs> Um, powering businesses to build a success. So looking at how can we deliver customer insights, personal experiences, you know, thinking through with you, the client customer experience, um, and of course, acquiring and nurturing, um, helping you acquire and nurture your own business as well. So there's a lot there. Uh, hopefully you've spared me that moment to tell the company line. Um, just give me one more minute. Uh, so as we think about reach, uh, Brad mentioned reach, um, you know, we as Microsoft Advertising still do rely heavily on PC traffic. I don't want to mince words about that. And so when I reference these numbers and growth that we've seen over the last few years in terms of global search share, this is referencing PCs. However, that's not the end of the story. Um, we are seeing growth across devices. Uh, again, whether it's PCs or what's happening with, uh, you know, voice, you know, think it's not just Cortana, like Cortana is also a skill set for Alexa and vice versa, uh, but you didn't have Xbox activity baked into all of that. Uh, a lot. Hey, John, go back PC. one slide real quick, though. Go yeah. back to your PC share. Yeah. So, so one of the things we hear a lot from people is, I hate mobile because we're business to business. Mm -hmm. And while B2B is growing a bit on mobile, um, Microsoft ads has traditionally been one of most, you know, PPC, people who spend a lot of time in paid search, one of their favorite places um, because okay. there's a lot of desktop share and it, it's a slightly different user base. So well, it, it is. It, it follows common sense too, Brad, right? So like yeah. if you think about who, who is the dominant operating system in business, well, it's Windows, right? So that's Microsoft. Um, and, and what devices are people using when they're at work? Well, their work computer. And so a lot of those are stuck on, on defaults, right? So like if you follow that breadcrumb, that stands to reason that a lot of people are gonna be doing uh, business related searches from work on a work device. And so that does play in our favor. And that's one of our, our hardest problems though is guessing what, to, what we can spend on Bing. Um, because if you look at this, right, you might just say, oh, we can spend a third of what we spend on Google on Bing. I mean, they're 36% query share. It's, but it wouldn't be, right? If you're in retail where there's a lot of mobile, it's probably 18%, 20%. If you're in B2B, it very well could be a third. Um, so it's always something just to keep in mind when estimating budgets for Bing based upon search share stuff. Yeah, I, I had a client, uh, sort of been about four years ago, that you know was spending close to a million dollars a month B2B advertising. And when you looked at search only, so take display and other activities out of that search only, we were at about a 55-45 a split, 45% uh, going to Bing and spending all day long. Um, and so, it, and again, it, it varies on vertical. It you know varies on a lot of things. It does vary on market, of course, um, as you can see in this this chart too. So that's an excellent point. All right, keep going. Yeah. So uh, mobile is something that we hear a lot of. Um, people are constantly asking us, what are you doing about mobile? What are you doing about mobile? We are making gains there. Um, not huge gains, just to be honest, but we are making gains. You know, a lot of that admittedly comes from our uh, partner network. Uh, and so I will go into a little more detail on this. We won't, we won't hang out here for long, but there's always a surprise in here for people in terms of like, oh, I didn't realize that... Uh, Microsoft advertising was uh, serving ads here or there. So um, hopefully, hopefully there's a surprise there for you. And then when we think about search, right, the story is not done there. There's a lot of development happening, but um, we do have a lot of efforts happening outside of search. So uh, looking at native advertising and what we call the Microsoft Audience Network. And so when you bring all of that together, and that's a massive reach, and I will go into a lot more detail on the audience network uh, soon. So 
We'll take a quick breather there and take a deep breath, take a quick sip of my iced coffee. So now let's jump in, uh, getting started with Microsoft Advertising. And again, if you are uh, not currently on the platform, hopefully I've laid things out so that it's a, a bit of a primer, just a lay of the land, if you will, um, and you know, giving you some steps to jump in quickly. If you are on the platform, again, hopefully there's some tidbits uh, nestled in there um, that either you didn't know or maybe you forgot. So uh, one of the, the best pieces here, and it, it's not a, an exclusive to us, but just illustrating that you can manage your ads on the web, uh, in that UI. There's also the Microsoft Advertising Editor, still getting used to calling it that, um, May for short, M-A-E. <laughs> uh, we also do have a mobile app, and, and while you can't do an extensive amount of optimization, say, there, um, it is what uh, Brad and I's uh, mutual friend, Matt Van Wagner, used to call the big red button. So you're out and about, you're out to dinner, and, and your client calls you, hey, uh, you know, X, Y, Z happened and we need to pause our ads right now. Well, it used to be you couldn't do anything about it unless you like, you know, had an employee on speed dial that, that was near a computer. Now with these apps, you literally can just go in and start pausing things on the fly. So um, there's a lot to be said there. It's actually one of the subtle things that's happened in our industry in the last couple of years. Not a lot of people talk about it, but it's a super convenient uh, application, both on the Google side and the Microsoft side. So now let's really get into the, the meat and potatoes here. So you know, one of the things that the Microsoft Advertising has really flexed its muscle on for several years now is the ability for you to scale from Google Ads out, right, and, and, and directly to us. Um, and so that's the Google Ads import feature. And what that means is, is that you can, in just a couple of clicks, go from no campaigns to say, okay, I want to import from Google. I'm going to do a, a read-only sign-in, which is effectively saying it's going to look at the data in the Google API and then effectively map it to our system and, and, and basically reconstruct it there. And it happens insanely fast. And if you're the type of, of, of advertiser who's like, you know what, I just I don't have enough of my personal bandwidth or my team's bandwidth to make changes in Google and then go make changes to Bing, particularly if I'm like running a new flight of ads or what have you, but we've got you covered there as well. So once you've initiated this, this import sync, you can schedule it as well. So whether that be daily, weekly, monthly, you know, if you have a particular rhythm, you're like, you know what, I want to make sure that the ads that I've written in Google, because that's where I spend most of my time, are also surfacing in the Microsoft advertising, absolutely can do that. And so seems Super simple. There were a lot of strings to be pulled. <laughs> hey John, let's let's stop. That happened. Hey John, before yeah. we we get into the strings to be pulled, um, so if you're syncing your Google Ads to your Bing Ads accounts, mm -hmm. does that automatically include all data, or can you say only campaigns or only ads and ad groups? Great, great point. So if you if you decide you want to do a scheduled import. Um, e even if you just do do it one off, you have the ability to say, I only want to import this campaign or set of campaigns. You can also say, I want to do only this set of campaigns and only new items, right? Okay. So it's doing it's doing a like a, a matrix comparison, right? essentially a V look up to say, okay, does this ad already exist? If it does, great. Don't bring it over, right? Because you don't want to duplicate it. Now, does that bring over campaign settings every time? If you tell it to look for net new, yes. So here's my I'm question. Sorry, at the I'm, end. Sorry, I'm sorry. If you if you if you don't check the like only look for new, it would be looking at those settings, correct? Okay. So how does a user manage bidding if they're setting bids in Google and they want different bids in Bing, or if Google is using target ROAS, which Bing doesn't it have, a line yet, item. and they've got. Yeah. So what happens when there's things that aren't inconsistent. I mean, the first time you do it, we're going to get through this in a second, everyone, so don't worry. Well, th there's some important things to double check, but from an ongoing basis, are there, are there flags that cause problems if you do automated scheduling to sync these? There certainly can be. Bid, bid is a line item, though, that can be checked to be on or off, right, in terms of do you want this to be brought over each time? Um, and so that is a catch. Now, to your point around 
say, a bid strategy, like you know, max clicks or max CPA or target CPA, something along those lines, you know, those, those inherently have a default, uh, a default setting, right? So if it's max clicks, my, my max CPC is you know, 50 cents or a dollar, whatever the case may be. I, to be honest, it's a bit of a gotcha question, Brad. I would have to go back and double check. <laughs> so, do you recommend people do scheduling? I mean, I so I mean, I love the import. I use the import a lot. If I make a new campaign in Google, I import it to Bing using this feature because I don't want to go recreate it. But I, I just re-imported it. Or if something was paused for two months, and then I know, hey, so, you know what? Something's changed. I'm just going to resync the whole thing. Yeah, but who right. should really use scheduling? So that is a, a, a tremendously uh, deep question, and I love that question because you're right. So I see a, a, a sync import, you know, the, this, this particular scheduling feature. Like if you are super small advertiser, and by that I mean, you know, no business is small, right? Every business is is <laughs> business is big, right, to the, those running them. Um, but, you know, in terms of like small budget, there's not a whole lot of changes happening. And you're looking for a super simple way to say, okay, I need to make one action and have it be reflected in two different platforms. This could be a great way to handle that. However, if you are at a scale where you've got things moving and you're, you are making management changes at Google and there's enough activity in Microsoft advertising making changes there as well, the, the argument starts to falter pretty quick. And, and to be frank, I am in the mind of, and, and I would have made the same argument three years ago before I, I came to work for Microsoft advertising, is Microsoft advertising is its own channel. And so it, you know, import is great to get a leg up and get things kick-started, right? With very minimal effort, you just click a couple buttons and wait for it to sync. Um, that's awesome. But from that point on, it is its own channel. And, and so therefore it's gonna have its own performance metrics, its own idiosyncrasies, whatever is happening behind the scenes. It needs to be tracked and monitored as its own thing and therefore managed as its own thing. So, so just an FYI. That's, where, that's my stance. Yeah, I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're a management platform, right? And so of uh, people who have both Bing and Google in our accounts um, in, in our system, we find that after about six months, um, there's a good 20% difference between two identical accounts, accounts that's identically, um, if they're really managing both. So there, there are definitely some differences that don't fall completely. All right, excellent. You'd be surprised the differences in query data, so search query data, but also if you're doing, you know, A-B testing with your ads or even with landing pages, because it is serving different audiences, yes, there's overlap, but, there, you know, there are also distinct audiences here that your performance results may vary. <laughs> yeah, our ads are where we see the biggest difference in. Yes. Yep. All right, excellent. Keep going, please. Yeah, so, you know, once you've done the import, then things again it is its own unique channel right and so that's that's a lot of what we want to cover here today is you know hey keep a watchful eye yes it's easy to do and make sure that uh, you tread carefully so you know one of the first things to to raise the flag on is in regards to time zones and ad schedules and, and this is something i think a lot of people like to bring up because it's one of the easiest uh easiest differences between the two platforms to to discuss right so with Google Ads and you set an ad schedule, that ad schedule is based on you, the advertiser. It's based on your time zone. Whereas on the Microsoft Advertising, the ad schedule is based on the user's time zone. So it's more of a global setting versus a, it's for me and I'm managing this, so it's based on my time zone. So those are very different, very different pieces. Um, uh, you know, honestly, like I, sadly, I didn't think about this a lot before I was in the Microsoft Advertising world behind the scenes. Um, I, I would argue that this is a better way to do it, right? It does make it easier for you to set, um, you know, set your targeting from an ad schedule perspective. Because I mean, dude, I remember, uh, and I just said, dude, I apologize. I, I reverted a little bit there. Um, <laughs> I remember managing a campaign where we needed to tackle uh, a truly global uh, piece, and it was like, okay. We know we're going to have ads that are going to go go live early, say in Asia, in Hong Kong, some of those markets, and then we're going to hit Europe and all these different things. Like, okay, man, how are we going to parse this out? Like, what's the most meaningful way? And while I am not advocating, <laughs> you have all of your targeting in one campaign for the entire world. That's not the best idea. You could feasibly do that 
when you think of uh, having to add schedule base on the user's time zone versus your own. So. Yeah, the, the easiest case for this is like we do some TV launches and we want ads to count down or, or show when a, a TV show is going to launch, but there's no pretty geographic time zones. Yeah. And so that's where this is super useful. And so speaking of locations, um, which is kind of the other side of this coin, I would say that uh, particularly in the last couple of years, I feel like, you know, both the, the Google side and the Microsoft side has come mostly into alignment, at least from like how you target and the types of available features. There's still some minor differences there. But where, where the differences start to show is, and, and I, I wish I'd grabbed a screenshot of like a specific example. I apologize that I didn't. But there, there can be differences in supported cities, counties, potentially even zip codes. Um, I forget the numbers now. I, I wrote an article on this several years ago on the Equizio blog, but um, there's like 40, 46,000 plus zip codes in the United States of those. I know at the time Google didn't even support like 10,000 of them. You know, Microsoft somewhere in, in a similar vicinity. And, and there's a lot of <laughs> reasons behind that for the, you know, like how they're bundled and the way that the, the different businesses look at them. But bottom line is, is that the, the, the zip codes that Google is effectively ignoring and the zip codes that Microsoft is effectively ignoring are not the same zip codes. <laughs> so um, you need to double check. If you do an import or you pull things over automatically, this, you know, check your, your ad schedule, but then go straight to location targeting. Did my intricately set up breakdown of cities or DMAs or states, counties, whatever the case may be, did that actually come over in the way that you expected it to into Microsoft? Chances are there might be a couple of things that are red flags. Yeah, and I can't stress this part enough. If we ever have a problem in import, it's locations. I live just mm -hmm. outside of Washington, D.C., and my region gets messed up on every import. Um, so it, it's worth knowing. If you're doing just a state, just a country, it's going to be right. Yeah. Um, but if you get down into DMAs versus MSAs, it, it, things can go a little complicated. Um, hey, and I would say I like have a county. question real quick too. Yeah. Um, they have dynamic ads running. Do you, uh, so do dynamic ad settings um, import correctly into Microsoft as well? So, uh, and let me just uh, bounce back a, a clarifying question. And when you say dynamic ads, do you mean dynamic search ads? So DSA. I'm guessing yes. So I'm guessing it's DSAs. Yeah. And if that's the case, then absolutely yes. So uh, I had a list. I'm not sure if I put it in here, but basically if you go through and start checking the boxes of ad types, um, ad type settings, et cetera, et cetera, by and large, we've got you covered. Uh, dynamic so, search ads, I think the only missing piece is us making a final push into the quote unquote like fully expanded dynamic search ad, which Google I think put in place like like five, six months my, ago and we'll have later this summer. From a DSA targeting standpoint, you support regex for website crawling, but you don't support imported feeds, correct? We do have DSA page feeds. Oh you do? Okay. Yep. Awesome. So in that case the the, the auto targets and like how, how you're matching to the feed will carry over. The feed itself will not. So like we we currently don't have a um, business data uh, import connection yet, um, and I don't know that that's necessarily on our roadmap. We, we've got something similar happening on the Merchant Center side, which we will talk about later, um, but in terms of the business feed, like where that feed would live, that you'll have to bring over, but in the grand scheme of things, that's a pretty quick to do, um, you know, given that all the rest of the rule sets will be in place. Perfect. We have questions answered. Let's go. Yeah. I love DSAs, by the way. It's, it's one of the best uh, perpetual keyword research machines you could ever ask for. You got to control it, but it's, it's pretty awesome. All right. <laughs> Speaking of control, uh, let's talk about search partners. So and we referenced that early on in, in the, uh, you know, the company man section of the presentation. Uh, but now let's talk about search partners. So Google's ha Google has search partners, but it's always been a black box. Uh, there's really no control there unless you're, you know, the biggest advertisers in the world, they can just be like, hey, Google, we're going to stop spinning unless you block this, this one site. Um, most of us are not those people. So uh, on the Microsoft advertising side, however, we do still offer control around search partners. And so, you know, the first of that being, hey, you know, I want all search networks. I want only owned and operated. That's what ONO stands for, which would be Bing, AOL, Yahoo, those primary search engines. Or I only want to target syndicated search partners which is a very lengthy list. And 
those partners bring volume and specifically mobile volume. And so that is where we are seeing a tremendous growth in mobile is from our syndicated partners. We are putting just a ton of resources there. We have an entire walking deck that explains all of the controls, automation, and, and people power that goes into keeping and maintaining that, that network. It's insane. Um, <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's a lot going on there. Uh, but there is solid performance. And, and you know, syndication sometimes gets a ding because the click-through rates aren't always as strong as on traditional search, and that's fair. However, it does make up for it in, in cost per click. And I also had another graph I could have included that, that referenced kind of global cost per acquisition. And it's actually, I think, within 20 cents, right, of, of what uh, traditional search was when you look at it from a top-down perspective, which is pretty darn solid um, in the grand scheme of things. But then this is really where things get fun. Is, like I mentioned on the Google side, you really can't do anything. So if, you know, if you've caught that, that search partners are like, well, I do get a lot of traffic, I get a lot of conversions, but there are, you know, there are some traffic sources in there that uh, are clearly bringing junk. There's really nothing you can do about that. On our end, you can. And so you can look at a publisher website report um, in the dimensions tab. It also lives in the reports uh, tab as well. And then let's say, okay, well, I've got these sites. They're just not working for me. Okay, well, you can add those as exclusions, both at the campaign level and also at the ad group level. So uh, that's one of those things where I feel like I've been talking about that for years, and I still see raised eyebrows of surprise. <laughs> yep. This, if <laughs> anyone, if you're spending a grand a month, you won't see much here. But if you're spending ten thousand, a hundred thousand a month, um, this is is a must review report. Like we put this up on our reviews as much as we look at search search terms. It's that important to really understand how your publishers are doing. And so I, I love the fact Microsoft shows this. Yep. And, and Dan, this one's for you. Duck, duck, go. Right there. Number four on the list. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right. So let's talk bids. Um, so, you know, and I made reference to this earlier. So different ad platforms means it's a different competitive landscape. So, you know, once once the engine is going, as it were, things are going to look a little bit different, right? Um, you're going to find, hey, this keyword I really have to crank up just because there's so many more competitors there on Bing versus Google and vice versa. So what does that mean for you? Okay, well, you've got to monitor your performance and adjust accordingly, whether that's in a manual fashion or implementing some sort of bid automation. And so when we look at the, the kind of the top-down view of what's happening with, uh, with bid strategies across the two platforms, we're pretty close uh, in terms of being in lockstep here. The only um, gaps for us at the moment are target impression share and target ROAS. I can say confidently target ROAS should be coming soon. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, don't know much about target impression share. It's probably on somebody's roadmap. They just haven't told me. So, uh, but you know, when you when you're thinking of imported campaigns or like, hey, this this particular feature say it's you know max clicks. I'm actually a, a fan of max clicks in certain situations, uh, but let's say you're using that in Google, like, yeah, this really works well for me. Um, we do have that to offer. My recommendation, though, is bring your campaigns over, run them on manual CPCs for a bit to get a feel for the traffic. Um, there's something to be said for just understanding the different data patterns, understanding the bid uh, landscape before you put in place some sort of automation, because you could set up max clicks on, on, on Microsoft Advertising with with a, a, a max CPC setting that's entirely too low, right? Or maybe it's too high. And you're not really going to know that until you get some data under your belt to make a decision. So that's my, my word and I'm sticking to it. Let's talk about a couple of exclusive features. Don't have a lot, but we do have a few. Add customizers. <laughs> that's not the exclusive feature. <laughs> so uh, for those of you that are about to raise your hand and, and ask, um, I love ad customizers though. Uh, it's you know effectively one text ad to rule them all. Uh, it's a feed-based mechanism that's really going to say, hey, uh, let's use some if-then logic. And if somebody is uh, searching on this keyword and matches this particular criteria, put these words or this price point or this sale verbiage into the ad copy. It's truly powerful stuff. Uh, I think I've used the phrase before. It's, it's living the dream of truly focused, relevant ads for paid search. Now, where the exclusive part comes in is that we've baked in, we being Microsoft Advertising, uh, we've baked in the ability to include an audience 
ID as one of those criteria. So if, you know, if this particular keyword um, you know, is, is, uh, is searched for and they belong in remarketing list A, I need you to serve this message versus if they're in remarketing list B, I need you to serve this message. Dude, there's that phrase again. Dude, that is powerful, powerful stuff. Um, so every audience has an ID. You know, when you create a remarketing list uh, in Microsoft Advertising, it's got an audience ID. If you have an in-market audience, which obviously you didn't bring that to the table, we brought that to the table for you, it also has an ID. You'll note that the spreadsheet that that screenshot comes from still says Bing Ads. I even checked it yesterday. It still says Bing Ads. Folks, rebranding in a big company takes time, so bear with us. <laughs> We're working on it. <laughs> um, but uh, if I didn't blow your mind with this one, uh, you know, take a minute, take a deep breath, uh, and let it sink in. Uh, this is, for me, honestly, one of the things I geek out most about uh, in terms of recent uh, developments in the world of search. I love, love, love ad customizers, and I think to apply audiences there is just tremendously exciting. Hey, John. Yeah. Does that extend to demographic characteristics like age and gender, too? You betcha. So pretty much um, every layer of targeting uh, within within the platform is a, a, a I'm trying to think of the right descriptor there. Uh, it should be an attribute, available attribute. What I can do is after after we're done here, I can track down a link to the list. So we did a webinar on demographics of in what kind of cases you want to show a male versus a female or a, a young person versus an old person a different ad. And in Google, that means duplicating campaigns or ad groups, which is a real pain, but it's super powerful. Um, this is saying you don't have to duplicate it; you just use a feed system. And so, if you if you took that, if you haven't seen the webinar, go watch it. It's a really good one. Um, but if you took some of those to heart, and you're like, yeah, we we actually look at ages when we think about our benefits for selling eyeglasses. Uh, which is a really important consideration. This is fantastic feature. It, it's taking the the pretty amazing opportunities that, that arose out of social advertising of you can get really granular with targeting based on demographics. And because of that, that meant that you could create some really tailored messaging. It's effectively taking, hey, we're a search nerd, saw that. We think that's pretty cool. <laughs> How can we do that in search? Um, I, I'm not saying it's a one-to-one -one correlation, but... Uh, it certainly follows the same trend. So this one is fun. Um, all of us on this call, when we write an ad, we should be including a call to action. If you're not, uh, you need to read some of Brad's amazing articles out on the interwebs. Um, calls to action are super, super important. We've one-upped that to say, okay, yeah, you should still likely write something into your ad. However, we do know that ad space is precious and uh, you know, those of us that are denizens of the internet are accustomed to, we see a button, we click a button. <laughs> and how can we play into that behavior? And so we've got the action extension. So this is a button, a clickable button, that will show with your ad in the search results, uh, at last count, 69 predefined actions to choose from. Uh, you know, watch now, sign up, start now. Uh, so John, you name it. Well, I was doing an e-commerce account into Bing um, a few weeks ago, and mm -hmm. we struggle with this significantly because every ad has a unique URL. It's a large e-commerce site. Mm -hmm. Call to action button is a single URL, right? It is, yes. So is there any way to make that echo the ad URL? There is not at this moment. And so for lead gen, some workable it's wonderful, alternatives. right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's wonderful. At a free trial, it's wonderful. Download, it's wonderful. But sometimes it, 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 it's one, as a user, you need to think about how you use this because it's a static URL with a potentially large list of destination URLs from the ad headline itself. Um, and so it can yeah. cause a mismatch. So for, for sure. And I mean, my, my gut says, like, yeah, my guess is there's probably some band-aid solutions there, right? So think about, okay, um, depending on how you, you have your, your ad groups broken down, but you know, is there like a category page that you could send it to just to test? Um, yeah. But that's a band-aid solution, uh, you know, given your point, right? Specificity is always best. 
Yeah. So if you're a small website, it's amazing. And if you know you want certain things, it's amazing. Just it's like the promotion extension and some of Google's price extensions are mm -hmm. kind of not always great. You got to really think through the strategy. This is the same one. It's wonderful, but it think about it before you just implement it blindly. Correct. And and to your point, yeah. I mean, on the B2B side, often the calls to action are considerably clearer. Call now. <laughs> yep. Contact us. I don't, I'm not recommending you use contact us, but for sake of example, um, typically quite clear. Yeah. So another one that you need to think through is the image extension. So for those that have uh, been paying attention now for a couple of years, uh, you know, Microsoft Advertising has had this extension in place for quite a while. Google even tested one for a time. Uh, and then they sunset it before it ever left a, a piloting stage. And so ours has maintained in that that dovetailed nicely with our current era, which includes the Microsoft Audience Network. So let me start with the search side first. This does, in fact, serve an image with your ads when you serve them, say, position one. It doesn't serve every time. I'm not 100% confident in all of the the backend uh, variables in terms of what dictates when it's going to show when it's not. However, it is relatively consistent. The screenshot that you see there um, is real. I know that because the guy on my team helps me run that account. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's, that is an ad that I had a hand in creating. Um, and so, you know, again, that it's, it's pretty cool. And so when you have an opportunity to include an image that's relevant, whether it's of product or, you know, related to say you know, again, if you're on the B2B side it's, and you're targeting a, a, a specific webinar, okay, can you include the image that that goes uh, with the sign-up page for that webinar, creating that one-to-one -one visual match? If we were to list like the you know the the five top hidden features that only the experts know and you should be using, this is one of them. Just yes. FYI, it's so underused and it's. I mean, a search is just text, or search results, right? So putting visual in there makes a huge difference. Yeah, it's, it's a big deal. And I, and I love that the powers that be um, you know, within Microsoft Advertising have allowed this to, to stick around, and now they have further incentive to do so. So you know, we've got the Microsoft Audience Network, which is our native ad network. Um, we have the ability for you to quote unquote extend a search campaign. So that means I've got my search campaign, which is keyword based, right? You've got audiences applied. That's all great. You can simply check a box and say, I also want my ads using this combination of targeting to serve contextually on the Microsoft audience network. Now you can do that without an image. It will just be a plain Jane text ad in a native environment, which can be effective. It does generate traffic. However, when you think about native ads and how and where they show, having that image there makes a complete package. And so the image extension is what enables that for search campaigns. Um, and for those of you out there that are grumbling, like, why do I want to extend a search campaign to native? <laughs> it, it actually performs better than you might think. Um, if, you, uh, you know, if you start to see that a particular site um, for native uh, is not necessarily performing the way you'd like it, you can also exclude it just like you can with the search partner network. So there, there's controls there, and I think that there's also incentive um, for advertisers to give that a try. So to that end, uh, what is the Microsoft Audience Network? So native advertising. We just talked about extending search campaigns. It used to be called intent ads. I think before that it was just called native ads. Don't, don't get me started on the naming conventions. <laughs> uh, but now we also have uh, in open beta in the U.S. It's in a closed beta in the U.K. and other countries as well. Um, and looking to expand very quickly beyond that. I believe we should be um, in global availability. Uh, well, not global. Sorry, general availability uh, for the U.S. later this calendar year. Um, and, and, and so again, think think a Google Display Network campaign on the Google Ads side. This would be analogous to that, uh, but giving you the opportunity to serve big, beautiful ads across MSN, Outlook Online, as well as Microsoft Edge. We do have several partners that we're piloting at the moment in terms of other high-quality websites out there, uh, and more will be added over the course of the next. Uh, fiscal. Uh, our fiscal just started in July, so we're very early in that. Uh, but it's a major, major investment area for us as a business. Um, it is working quite well. I, 
I'm not going to tell you how much money it made last year, but it made a lot, and that was in pilot, right, in a, in a beta scenario. So it's a big deal. A lot of our biggest advertisers are, are in love with it at the moment just simply because MSN, even though it's not the top traffic site in the world, it is still one of the top 10, um, and you get premium placement uh, right up there at the top. And so if you do well on display with Google, it's worth giving uh, MSAN, as we lovingly call it, uh, the Microsoft Audience Network a try on this side of the house. So massive reach, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into there, There's better things for us to talk about uh, than some of those numbers. So <laughs> uh, continuing with the thread of exclusives, Brad, it might have been you or maybe Dan, I don't remember, one of you. One of you mentioned LinkedIn profile targeting uh, towards the top of this, uh, this webinar. This one's pretty exciting. So uh, I forget, I think it's what, three years ago, four years ago, Microsoft bought LinkedIn, I think it was four. Um, and you know, myself included, like one of the first things out of our mouths was, that's awesome. What does that mean for Bing? You know, now what, now what does it mean for Microsoft advertising? And, you know, early on, nobody really knew. Uh, two, two distinct businesses, Microsoft actually allowed LinkedIn to run, for the most part, as a standalone business, and that stands true to this day. And so if you think about it in that regard, it's been a complex relationship to say, how do we zipper up? all of this data that both of these distinct companies have in a meaningful way that, so it's one of the slides I showed earlier, protects the client data on both sides. We're not exposing anything unnecessarily, um, you know, and we're not, we're not uh, abusing the relationship that we have with, with our, our clients and customers on both sides. And so it took a while to figure that out. But this is really the first uh, foray into what that could look like, and, and it is a doozy. So, when you think about LinkedIn and how you have your profile set up, um, you know, job function, what is it I do? Well, I'm learning strategist, so that means you know, learning and development, which tiptoes into a much broader subset of human resources. I don't think of myself as human resources, but technically speaking, you know, that's where learning and development lives. Um, think industry, think uh, company name, right? So all three of those are now targetable elements within a campaign and or uh, an ad group within Microsoft Advertising. So now, I just want to give a few ways that we've used this already, and it's only been out for a few months, right? Mm -hmm. Account-based marketing, when people are doing, you know, ABM and they're just trying to target Oracle for the moment, this is one of the few ways to do it. If you are only trying to reach VPs and up, you can do it this way. If you are trying to reach people who with a specific job title, so we sell PPC software, people with things like a PPC analyst as a job title is not the decision maker, but they're the influencer. So that's a different ad for us than someone who's a director of digital marketing. That's a decision maker. We I actually want subscribe to the challenger mindset, friend. Right. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> I mean, that's that is, I mean, three of, of probably 20 ways we've used this in the past. I mean, two months, three months at most, it's been out. Um, so there are some really creative ways to use this data. And and I would say too, I mean, for B two B, it was immediately. Duh, I get it. Um, you know, I, I'm already on LinkedIn, so you know, this is a no brainer. Somebody is searching for my product category on Bing, and I can say I want to increase the bid because they work at this company. I mean, of course I'm going to do that. You know, I think it was the retail side of the house where there was a little bit of head scratching going, okay, how do I do this in a meaningful way? It's still applicable. So if you think about in-market audiences or in any audience for that matter that you can apply as a, um, you know, a bid only or in the Google vernacular observation, right? Um, apply them and, and watch what happens, and you may be pleasantly surprised, right? So some of you, particularly the, the really savvy <laughs> marketers out there, likely already have a feel for people in, you know, based on my persona research, people in these verticals, these industries tend to be a customer or a customer that maybe spends more with me. Um, and if you have that data, this should be a no-brainer for you as well. If you don't, this could be a way of research, right? So make some assumptions, put them in as bid only, you know, leaving the, the bid adjustment at zero, of course, and just monitor the data, right? Uh, see what comes through, how many impressions, how many clicks of the, of the people that are coming through actually matched to that audience. You may be pleasantly surprised and then may then just decide to, to up uh, the bid adjustment. 
All right. So some things that you may have missed. So they're not exclusives, um, but certainly powerful features nonetheless. And to be honest, I feel like even though there was a marketing push behind them from, from the Microsoft advertising side, it wasn't very loud, or at least didn't feel loud <laughs> to me. So one of those is scripts. And if you're using scripts uh, in Google Ads, then why wouldn't you give them a go in Microsoft Advertising, particularly given that you can copy and paste the script over. And we have built in automatic find and replace. So it'll look for AdWords app or MCC app and automatically replace it with either Bing Ads app and or Accounts app. I mean, that's basically taking all of the hard uh, nitty gritty work out of it for you. If the script works at Google, bring it over, paste it, we'll do the automatic find and replace, and boom, you're good to go. And if it is an unsupported feature, something that's in Google Ads that we don't have, again, our system will automatically flag it as an unrecognized symbol. So, so I want to, so everyone, this is why we like to use the import from Google feature first because you're going to have things like campaign names sometimes mm -hmm. or label features. If they're named one thing in Google, something else in Microsoft, your script will run, but it won't do anything because it can't find that entity. If you import first, you have the exact same naming conventions, so now your scripts also work. Brilliant. Go ahead, John. I just want to. Yeah. That's a big caution for everybody. Is is naming. It's it's a it's a caution, but I think that's just it's sage advice, right? So naming conventions matter way more than I think anyone gives it credit for. <laughs> and that goes in in pretty much any advertising channel you can think of. Um, all right. Now here's another fun one. So campaign experiments, right? It's been around in some form or another uh, on the Google Ad side for, for several years, but new new for us um, on the Microsoft advertising side. But uh, it's right there in the UI, uh, experiments. You go through and get that set up, whether it's campaigns and you want to test settings or budgets or what have you. It's also at the ad group level, ads, keywords, audiences, pretty much every level within the, the campaign grid as you see it, potentially up for an experiment. And so you know, what does that output look like? Right, okay, I'm seeing my, my experiment, I'm seeing the performance differences, and then from there, then you can take action, right? Um, what is it you actually want to do with that pause experiment, et cetera. So again, this is one where, you know, is this necessarily um, going to push the needle? No. However, if you are into that granular testing, as I know Brad is, <laughs> um, experiments can really be uh, a great way to put, put your ideas to the test. Product audiences. So uh, this would be, you know, saying, hey, I've got my shopping feed set up and I want to make sure that I am tracking uh, for audience purposes, what's happening in my shopping cart, right? Where, where are they abandoning the cart? Um, and, and for what products were they actually shopping for, et cetera? All of that is coming. It's in active uh, piloting right now. I believe it's in open beta in the US. Uh, it's working exceptionally well. So this will be coming uh, live, available to everyone quite soon. Another good one is similar audiences. And so this is one that, you know, I've heard from so many people like, you know, we would love to have some sort of look like audience, look like audience. And so that is what this is. Also in active piloting currently, um, I believe, don't quote me on this, I believe it should be going uh, for global availability sometime later this calendar year, so quite soon. Responsive search ads. Uh, this one you may not be excited about. <laughs> There's a lot of debate in the industry right now in terms of the effectiveness of responsive search ads. Um, however, you know, if you think about uh, kind of our mantra of Google parity, that's something that we talk about quite a lot of just making it efficient for you, the advertiser, to, to work with us in a scalable way. This, this definitely falls in line with that. It is an, an interesting testing opportunity, but that's a whole other webinar in and of itself, I believe. And then last but not least, we talked about ad customizers, and I was just raving about that, gushing about that. If functions falls directly in line with this. The difference here is ad customizers are based on a feed, which can certainly give you, you know, a lot of muscle to flex, right? Um, dream big as long as you're <laughs> proficient in creating spreadsheets. Um, if functions, however, does effectively the same thing, but directly within the, the user interface. So no spreadsheet required. Uh, and it's just using base if-then logic. So if you can create an if-then logic statement in Excel, 
you can do it in the actual ad format. So hey, coming John, soon in testing currently. Yeah. So if you're in Google, if you're using ad customizers, you must have an ad without customizers because if they can't replace it, they've got to show something. Is Correct. that also in Bing? It does. Okay. So this is, so if functions are great, everyone, um, they're wonderful. And it is also a way to allow some sort of a, non ad customizer customized ad as because you can use these as your backup because there's always something that can show um so if you're really into ad customizers and you're sort of sick of that other ad that gets impressions that you really don't want to show um, these help you customize even your backup ads there's a back door to everything man <laughs> all right we've got six minutes to cover shopping which seems just like such a backhanded way to treat shopping given its, its importance to the industry. So we'll move through this quickly, but uh, I just want to touch on, so we, we, we covered Google import for your campaign structure, right? And, and whatever you've been doing in the Google ad system, bring it over to Microsoft advertising to, to get things running quickly and efficiently. So one of the, my favorite things that happened last year was this particular feature. So the Google merchant center import. So for those of you that are in e-commerce and you're like, it always a pain in the butt. It's like, okay, what do I do with the feed? Do I, you know, can my system even create two different feeds for different platforms? Or like if you use a middleman, so like I know for a time I was using a service called Atten Software, which would take the Google feed through the, the Merchant Center API, and then you could set rules to change it if you needed to, and then it would spit it back out uh, for, for, for Microsoft. That's obnoxious, plus it costs more money. Um, this says, hey, you've got your feed in Google. It's set, you know, you've done the work there. Now you can just pull it over automatically. And so this is huge. Uh, and particularly if you think about um, the recency uh, that's required for a product feed, right? 30 day uh, cycle, you can have this automated. So it's pulling it in on, on the right schedule uh, that, you know, matches the changes that you're making. But on the flip side of that is saying, okay, yeah, let's get the feed going in an automated way. However, you know, maybe I want that cycle to be every two weeks or maybe just once a month. However, in the in between, so between those, those scheduled imports, how can you make sure that if I make a change to a price or a description, or not, sorry, not description, the price and or the availability of a product on my site, how can I make sure that that's reflected in my ads? Well, that's automatic item update. So when you have that enabled, you can choose price only, availability only, or both. And what this does is it actually uses our, our web crawling bot to go out. It's checking your site constantly anyways. Uh, in this case, it's bringing some data back to say, okay, hey, I note this product with that product ID, it's price changed today. Okay, great. It'll change that for you for when your product ad shows in the search results. That's pretty powerful stuff. Uh, and it's literally a checkbox. So if you're into local inventory ads, uh, you know, again, local e-commerce, We've got you covered, local inventory ads. Merchant center promotions, another way to, to kind of flex that muscle and get some extra uh, salesy <laughs> uh, elements, if you will, uh, in the, the shopping results. Shopping ads and Bing Images. Um, again, Bing Images is actually quite popular. If you didn't know that already, a lot of people have, like, they still use Google, but they've decided, you know what, Google Images tinkered enough they've actually are migrating over um, to, to, the, to the Bing images, which, cool, uh, thank you. Um, but we now have uh, shopping ads there as well. Um, we have a dedicated shopping tab. <laughs> you le learn a little bit too much about me in this screenshot. I'm a musician and I play video games. If you see the uh, recent search in there is for Rocket League for the PC. <laughs> uh, the multiple images experience is another great way to say, okay, hey, you know, particularly if you think clothing, shoes, anything that's going to be served well by having multiple images, this is the way that you take care of that, both in your feed, but also in how your ad serves in the search results. So quick, quick flash through shopping, but wanted to make sure that I mentioned that. Thanks very much. And everyone, uh, I, I just want to say thank you, Brad, for joining us, and especially John Lee for putting this all together. Thanks hey, for thanks having me. John. That was, uh, that was fantastic. And I hope everyone takes away the fact that there are a few buttons you can push without doing huge amounts of work to get started with Bing. If you haven't done it or you did it a year ago and you're like, oh gosh, maybe I should revisit this, it's still just 
a button push. So I, I really do encourage you to give it a good try. Great. Thanks, Brad. And thanks again, John. And we hope to talk to you again. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.